Hey guys, welcome to the channel. Today we're going to be talking about Polytrade. If you like these kinds of videos, you should definitely like, comment, and subscribe. If you're on the Patreon, you're getting access to this first. And definitely remember one more thing. This is not financial advice. We don't accept liabilities for losses that you incur. And everything here is for news and research purposes. So with that in mind, you'll be able to enjoy the content of this video. Now, Polytrade. I'm gonna go over Polytrade. This is gonna be more or less something for the Patreon to start. It's gonna be launched first there. And the reason being is that, you know what? They're paying monthly. They should get a little bit of exclusivity. So if you guys are watching this on the YouTube, it might be a little bit later. Definitely fucking, you know, subscribe to the Patreon. So, Polytrade. It's at $1.50. Just got released onto KuCoin, very young coin. Market cap under 10 billion. Uh, 10 million, excuse me. Circulating supply only 6 million. Now, this is definitely something to look at. And the reason being is this. First of all, A, just remember something. It's extremely, extremely high risk. Very high risk. Definitely a risky biscuit, but a lot of potential to succeed. And I'm going to give you the reasons why I think that it's still a good pick, even though it's considered risky. So the reason it's risky really is because of how small the supply is right now against the market cap. So it's a micro cap. It's puny. Now, that's where the most parabolic gains could happen. That's the reason why I'm bringing it to you guys to check out. So here's where I'm going to start. It's got that 6 million supply, but a max supply of 100 million. So there will be more tokens released at time as time goes and this is basically i'm going to go over the, the reasons why i think that this could this could be a good pick and it could potentially fly off the chain in one quick movement and then be put out of out of uh out of reach for a lot of people very quickly so what is polytrade trying to do polytrade is basically they're trying to provide SMEs, so small to medium enterprises, the ability to access liquidity on a global level. And that's based off of like uh, credit, right? So a lot of the issues right now in credit and insurances on a large scale, a global scale, is very complicated, meaning you need a lot of banks, you need a lot of insurances involved, you need a lot of things involved, a lot of, um, a lot of moving parts, so to speak. And not just moving parts, but moving parts from large institutions. And the thing is, is large institutions, they tend to keep SMEs, once again, small to medium enterprises. I'm going to say that a few times in this video, so just remember. SME, small to medium enterprises. These large companies, these large institutions, they keep the smaller guys out of the global level so they can never scale and grow. So it kind of becomes like a barrier of entry for someone who is smaller to be able to access larger lines of credit in the global marketplace. Now, it's extremely valuable thinking about like, okay, imagine you're a small business. You want to get a purchase order from uh, Mexico to Canada. Right off the bat, for you to be able to get access to that credit, you have to go through trade finance. And trade finance is just a type of finance where they back, they back pur purchase orders by insurances and credit so that way the company could receive basically the goods and the other company could receive the money in a timely manner where both parties could basically uh, have their payment and their goods in a respectable schedule. But the issue is, is that because most of these things are being done on paper and by banks and all these different things, A, it becomes a large issue with discrepancies and transparency. And then once that happens, it has to be litigated in court. And that's where it becomes complicated because a small business or a medium in business, the, the SMEs, they, they can't access certain things on that level the same way that a larger corporation can. And the other thing is this, to actually get access to these credits and to get these loans, it's backed off of real world assets and insurances, so bonds and stuff like that. But the thing that's complicated is the people who access these bonds are banks. And the thing is, is that you're not just gonna go through one bank to get these kinds of, uh, to get trade finance, you gotta go through multiple sometimes. So it's like one rejects you, you got to go to the next. And then let's say you do go through multiple that, that don't, like you go through the list and you get one that doesn't reject you. Now the reality is, is that bank has to find another bank 
where they're willing to access those liquidities based off of trade finance and, and backing of bonds and shit like that. So now it becomes like a fucking game of musical chairs just to get your purchase order out. And then that raises your price parabolically on what it should cost to actually buy and ship and have access to global markets. So I think that this does have a very good use case regardless of what its supply to market cap ratio is. That's why I could kind of see this project working. And I'm going to go into that a little bit more. So I just explained what trade finance is. It's just the ability to be able to access liquidity on a, on a global level through bonds and other uh, forms of insurances and credits and then to be able to see proper receive proper invoices and finance based off of smart contracts right so you have off balance sheet lending option to prioritize receivables more favorable pricing because you don't got to go through the banks and then here's the thing that makes it beautiful right one of the reasons why i could actually see this working right is that because it's based off of a smart contract and a liquidity protocol meaning that like let's say someone stakes a billion dollars worth of Ethereum for this uh, liquidity protocol. It's like, you don't have to go to a bank. You just borrow it from the liquidity pool and do it all based off of that. So you're reducing the fees and reducing the barrier of entry, allowing for flexibility of participation and allowing for a more, more like a crowdsourcing mechanism. So like instead of you going and going to a bank and trying to get a loan and then being rejected and then having to scramble, now you just go to the liquidity pool the liquidity pool bases your your credit risk based off of previous business uh, respects. And then from there, you're able to access the money based off of if you pass that credit check with the system, as well as the ability to have a reduced rate by passing it. And then as you keep doing business with the system, you get better and better rates because it's based off a of smart contract. So the more you show that you're legitimate and you're respectful, the smart contract will repay you for that. It will make your rates better. And considering that they say that 50%, I believe, of trade finance doesn't happen simply because of how many barriers there are between banks. So they're approaching a $1.5 trillion market just in trade finance that can happen because of uh, issues in terms of getting funding. And they break down the reason why uh, why this will work, right? So... I'm going to go into the white paper, but first, uh, first, let me just go over something right here. So look, like I'll, I'll post all these links to in, in the, in the description of this video. So I guess before I break down the team, I'll go into the white paper. So poly trade contents, excuse me, give me one second. Founders note, this just explains the history of trade finance, how it works, the evolution, how we got to where we're at, the current market, borrowers gap, you see a 50% gap in Asian and African markets. They're, that's where they're approaching, right? And they're talking about all the gaps where people can't get shit. And that's a large percentage, 30%, 30% get rejected. You know what I mean? So it's, 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 it's very complicated and it gives you really good statistics here. Now, these are the reasons why there's challenges faced by most SMEs to actually get into trade finance and to be able to access global liquidity. First of all, it's this. It's unfamiliarity with the, tra with the trade finance instruments, meaning that a major challenge that's, that, that, that gets in front of people is they just they don't know it. They don't know about it. This isn't something that they teach you. This is complicated. This is something you have to go to like finance school and business school. Like This isn't easy. And then to get contacts within it is not easy. It's a very closed circle. And because of that closed circle, only a few people could benefit from it. So look at this. 32% of lenders found it challenging to deal with the lack of familiarity among, barrio, bar, bar, among borrowers. And the other 26% said that bank staffs, bank staffs lack of familiarity with trade finance products, limited transactions. So now it's not even just the people that are limited, but it's the banks that are limited. So 20%, 26%, that's a quarter. That's a quarter of the people who don't even know how to use it. And then on the other end, it's 30%. So both people are unfamiliar. That is large enough percentages where that right there, like people don't know how to use it. Like that's enough for this to become valuable already because blockchain and smart contracts will make this easier and more accessible. Next thing, inability to present requests appropriately. So therefore, 
if the SME doesn't necessarily present it properly in the right way, because trade finance has a lot of jargon, then right there, that's a huge gap. You won't be able to do anything because you didn't present it properly. And because you can't present it properly, you get stuck. And then that really leaves out a lot of people and it causes exclusion from the trade finance uh, pools of liquidity. So that's another huge issue. Next thing, lack of collateral. So they say 40% of survey respondents cited lack of collateral as a common reason for not being able to access trade finance requests. So it's like an example of that would be Pacific borrowers cannot use real estate as collateral, making it difficult for lenders to, to service their trade finance needs. So it's like now because of different rules and regulations globally, it's hard for people to set a standard on how to access these, uh, these liquidity pools. And that's 47%. That's large. Next thing, high borrowing costs. As I mentioned, small businesses and large corporations, banks, financial, financial institutions, they're all able to charge fees to the small business, which is disproportionately high because it's a small business. SMEs get fucked the most because they're not big enough to have access to all the different um, tools that other institutions have, which is like corporations, banks, all this, right? So high borrowing cost is a really, really complicated part of it. And then the next thing, painful process. Each financial institution has designed its own set of processes. And the lack of standardization means every business suffers from this excessive documentation. And that really makes it a ridiculous thing because then it reduces the barrier of entry by a lot because from there, think about it, like everyone is dependent on the bank and even the banks don't know what the fuck they're doing half the time. So this is like, the more I read into this project, the more I realize this, this is actually something quite valuable. I might have stumbled upon a serious gem here, but it's a high risk gem. So if it hits, it's going to hit like a fucking home run truck. But if it doesn't, the floor is below $1. So $1.50 where I'm posting this video, $1.50 is the max you could lose per share versus the potential ceiling of where I'll get to shortly. Check this out. So last thing, lockdowns caused by COVID-19 and made it even more complicated to actually access these things and paper documents. That's just another reason why this blockchain might succeed. Next thing, high transactions costs. So because it's so centralized centralized, and the siloed processes pushes operational costs for lenders, may, meaning that you need so many different moving parts that it becomes expensive, small businesses, SMEs, they won't be able to actually ask, access it. 59% of lenders mentioned high transaction costs or low fee income as a factor for the restricted borrower's access. So meaning like things are just too expensive. You know, it's just not worth it. Then another thing too is look at this. So 50% of respondents mentioning high transactions, high transaction costs as an obstacle to the finance. Another barrier. Next thing, absence of decentralized credibility benchmarks. So because there's no standard of credit ratings and being able to like have a benchmark that everyone could use, 52% of lenders get messed up by that so look at here 52 percent of lenders found low credit rating of the borrower's country of the country not even the borrower the borrower could be spot on but the country's a credit risk bam now it's a, ch a challenge in trade finance 51 percent of lenders struggle with low credit ratings of intermediary banks in developing countries so now the bank has bad credit so now the, the they can't give the loan 51 percent it's a lot Next, 43% of lenders said credit rating of borrowing firms served as a barrier to trade finance. So just because one uh, credit uh, minimum credit score is here and you're here, you just can't get in. That's it. Too bad. You're not even in the application process. Now, because of those things, like obviously there's way more here to get into as to why this is a potentially valuable thing. But... Uh, I'm not going to break down the whole white paper for you here because the video is getting kind of long and I want to get to other parts. But there's one thing here that I really wanted to bring up in this white paper. All right. Well, yes, granted. Look at this. So trade finance is equivalent for $2.7 trillion in volume just in 2018. And Asia, Africa, and other places, because Europe right now is the main place and 
America, New York specifically, is another big place for trade finance. And those are really the only places that you could have access to it properly. So something like this will bring trade finance available to a lot of different people outside of those two regions. So that's, that's valuable in its own. And that they're approaching this from the right perspective, in my, my opinion. But I'm looking for something specific here. Give me a second. Short banking regulations, fraud rule, hold on, distributed ledger. Basically, the white paper is breaking down how important uh, how important smart contracts are going to be to this field. And I kind of agree because you know what? I didn't know what trade finance was until I looked into this. Then I realized, oh shit, this is a use case that would probably be very valuable. And the way they explained it, the way they explain how it's going to be valued as a coin actually makes a lot of sense. Okay, bam. This is what I wanted. 4.1. So trade coins and tokenomics. So this is what I really wanted to get into. You go over the white paper. I'm going to leave it in the description, but it's worth reading. Next. Introduction. Skip that. Trade coins are a mechanism to increase the trust between all parties involved in receivable financing. So these tokens are a key payment instrument within the Polytrade platform, which will be used in a greater trade finance system, right? And what they plan to do is to allow, as you can see here, provide access to sellers. So sellers will be required to pay a specific amount of trade coins each year to access the Polytrade platform. The seller's financing limit will be determined in multiples of 100 of the value of trade coins held by them. So for example, and this is where it gets interesting. If a seller has trade coins, worth $1,000, their financing limit will be $100,000. Paid access to the platform will serve as a check to ensure genuine sellers get registered on the platform. So let me break this down for you. It's like you buy trade. By buying trade, you are allowing yourself basically to be part of a membership, which allows you collateral on a global level in a smart contract with liquidity locked into it. So you're borrowing against the smart contract using the trade as trade tokens as access to it to be able to get multiples of credit of up to 100, 100x. So if you put $1,000, you get 100 times your, your, your borrowing power based off of the liquidity protocol. But it's also based off of the fact that you're going to be building credit with it. And people that are buying the token to be able to do these things, they're going to be legit businesses. There's going to be screening behind it because it's all based off of a, blo a, block, a blockchain with transparent uh transparency and that kind of gives me an idea because look here it says the seller has trade coins worth one thousand dollars so i could give you even an idea of what their rough price prediction is because if this becomes a membership thing then the trade coins will be worth money because there's only a, a six currently there's only a six million supply with a hundred million max so if they're going to be approaching certain markets this thing has to be worth something to be able to access multiples of a hundred worth of credit so it's not a price prediction but they mentioned that that you know if it's going up in multiples of a hundred then they're going to want to keep the supply of trade low so that way it's like the, the the coins become more like a membership fee it becomes like access to a membership in a liquidity protocol that's how i'm envisioning it now Obviously, I'm gonna look. I'm gonna leave the white paper there. I'm gonna leave leave the white paper from here because I more or less said what I wanted to say and why I think this is valuable. Next would be they spoke at the crypto summit in 2021 in Dubai. So they mentioned the fact that, you know what I mean? Like they showed their minimum viable product, meaning that the minimum that you could give for it to show that it works to some degree. And during the summit, Sandeep Nelwal who's a co-founder and the and a coup of Polygon, the network, said that Polytrade is being integrated and expressed his excitement about the process being made by the Polytrade team, emphasizing the importance of such projects in impacting the real world economy. So Sandeep N uh, Nelwal, he, he was one of the founders of Polygon. So if you think Polygon is going to be bullish, imagine something like this, which is a tackling tackling a part of finance that nobody fucking talks about or cares about. So 
they are kind of like the first mover on something that's like really overlooked. And that's one of the reasons why I think it could grow very, like very rapidly and properly. But that's just something to keep in mind. They, another thing here is they've already linked up with Chainlink. So Polytrade is partnered with Chainlink to focus on the ability to use stablecoin lending. So they've already integrated a relatively big project with it. And that's a solid partnership. So I like to see that kind of stuff. And Chainlink will help provide accurate price feeds and accurate credit slash insurance risk tolerance and stuff. That's what Chainlink does. That's why it's going to be valuable, Chainlink specifically. Polytrade, we're finding out more now. Next thing, Shima Capital. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm more or less going to go into that afterwards to tie this whole thing up. They're just investing into it. It's a strategic investment partner. It's a global investment fund. That's that's another group that's basically involved in, in it. There's value there. Nothing bad about that. Next thing here, it mentions that it raised $1.2 in funding. So it didn't even raise a lot but it was just enough to get it started. And that's more or less what you want to see because now they've basically added in more value to their network without necessarily having to raise larger amounts of money. It's a very small amount raised, 1.2 million. So the way I see it is that they only needed that to be raised to start and they're building the rest off of actual use case and, and showing shit, that's what you want to see. Next thing too, I mentioned being built on Polygon and right here. Hold on. Not mistrust and driven the community to achieve more. This is what Sandeep said. He said, exciting to see Polygon becoming the chosen platform, not just for crypto native ventures, but also for centuries old trade finance related applications. Meaning he, he's happy to hear that something that's really outdated and needs to be updated is being done on his platform. So there's value in that because no one's tackling something like this, which even 25% of bankers don't even know how to fucking do. So there's value in that, from my opinion, at least. Now, Polytrade team is well experienced in invoice factoring business with 500 million USD under their belt in the last six years, meaning that they've helped in trade finance for up to $500 million, their team. It's not a small number, especially considering that the market cap of this thing is under 10 million right now. So that should be at least a good sign of being able to do something. Now, getting this business running on a blockchain will be much needed uh, push that both worlds need. So they understand they need it. Next thing here, yeah, minimum viable product in Dubai. I mentioned that. I mentioned too that they started their on Pokestarter. Poke and that's how Polytrade launched. So it was on a, on a DEX. And then briefly, I'm just going to go over the, the teammates now. So before I wrap this up, Piyush Gupta, he's a founded Requaza Capital, Requaza Capital. He raised over 500 million in trade finance, so on and so forth. He's earned his right in trade finance, even though it's something that I barely hear about. But I've looked into Requaza, Requaza Capital it has money flowing through it. It's not nothing. So it's worth it's worth considering. I'm sure he could do more considering that Sandeep Maywal is behind him. This here too, I looked up a lot of these dudes, but the ones that stood out the most, hold on a second. The one that stood out also was this guy right here. So Samip Siganya. He is one of the advisors here. Oh, wait, hold on, more advisors. He's one of the advisors here. He was the founder of QuickSwap. So QuickSwap is another swap. There's value in that. Sandeep, founder of Polygon. Polygon. There's value in that. This guy here, Yida Gao, he was, in, he was mentioned in the Forbes 30 under 30, which is people who are under 30 who have, uh, oh, I, I don't want to say standing ovation, but who have been proven as being like exceptional people under 30, which is definitely worth something. People don't just get into these things for nothing. So more or less, you could look into this stuff more on your own. Obviously this one's a high risk play 
for a potentially high reward in a short amount of time, but it's not guaranteed. It's very risky. So keep in mind, this isn't financial advice. I'm going to wrap up this video and leave the rest to you to look up in the links and descriptions. So take care.